A few years ago, I was given a tour of Claridge's in London. They were excavating five additional basement floors underneath part of their existing structure. Uh, the engineers had to answer a question. Could the existing raft, the foundation of the building above, withstand the removal of the underpinning sediment? To answer this question, they approached the owner, asking for documentation. The owner said they didn't have any documentation, that the engineers were on their own. The engineers were fortunate in one way, and that is that the hotel serves as a kind of a refuge for royalty and celebrities. And because of this cultural prominence, perhaps someone at some point wrote something down. Now, it was a long shot, but they started to look through these non-digitized paper volumes one by one, flipping through articles written from many decades ago, looking for a clue. And they managed to find something. In an article from the builder in 1931, someone wrote that a concrete foundation some four feet thick and reinforced with 75 ton tons of steel was laid. Uh, it wasn't a lot, but it was enough that with a little bit of destructive testing, they were able to decide to move ahead with the excavation. Now, this story represents a kind of a pattern, a pattern that I have personally seen over and over and over again on all of the projects that I've ever worked on. And that is that there is a question and then we struggle through this kind of information inaccessibility in order to come to an answer. The technologist in me wonders, is there a way to accelerate this process, to shorten the amount of time between question and answer? A question that haunts many university campuses is the availability of lab space. When a new faculty member is hired, the university must promise that they can accommodate that new faculty member's vision. Um, this promise is difficult to make, mainly because there is no easy way to verify the availability of space, the kinds of utilities that serve each of these spaces. And because of this uncertainty, lab space remains one of the most heated topics of debate between administration and faculty. In order to solve this, facility management approached a number of Scantabim service providers asking for a quote uh, to digitize campus. The process is something called Scantabim. You go in with a LiDAR enabled device, you capture this three dimensional information, then you convert it into a building information model. And the process is just as tedious as you would imagine. You have to go in, you have to trace every window and door and wall and pipe and duct and so on. If you're new to Scantabim and you want to know more, uh, I'll point you towards this free resource on YouTube. Uh, a number of lectures on the process of Scantabim. I myself also participated in these videos. Uh, this one here is a one hour accelerated A to Z beginner to advanced. Despite all of the benefits that a building information model would provide these universities, knowing about available lab space being one of them, they looked at the quote they received from the Scantabim service providers and decided that it is simply too expensive. Uh, I work for a company called Integrated Projects, where we're working really hard to lower the barrier to entry so that professionals that operate in the built environment can have the information that they need. Um, our main service is something called BIMIT. We receive point clouds from users. We convert those point clouds into building information models. If you go to our BIMIT calculator, we provide you with an instant quote. Uh, you just have to enter the size of the facility, the type of facility, uh, what scopes you want uh, represented within the resulting models, and uh, we provide you with cost and schedule on the spot. 
the service has actually proven to be very popular. Uh, we're still a very young company and we're approaching 4,000 projects completed. And uh, as you can imagine, operating at this kind of scale, we are exploring every possible tool in order to enable greater efficiencies. Uh, the first of which is just very strict standardization of deliverables. Uh, beyond that, we're also looking into uh, automation tools. Um, these are some of the automation tools that are available commercially on the market today. I'll be walking you through some of these categories. Um, on the far left, we have the first user directed snapping and fitting. Uh, there are several tools, uh, mainly plugins within this category. Um, they require a user to look at the point cloud to navigate to a region where there is an object of interest. Um, they then need to identify what objects they want to model. Is this a wall? Is this a pipe? The type of that object. And then once they've selected the type, they then need to click somewhere in some sequence, the region in which that object exists within the point cloud. And then the software will automatically fit, uh, that object to the points, uh, within that region. Here we see a wall being fit within plan view of the point cloud. Um, there are capabilities for fitting things like windows and doors within the terrestrial light or bubble view. Then there are also tools for fitting more niche types of objects, things like bent pipes and uh, pipe fittings. But of course, anything that requires this kind of manual uh, model or input just takes up time. Uh, the, the modelers still need to identify the types of objects, still need to click on every single object within the facility. And so the second category um, tries to overcome some of this manual input burden, uh, automated geometric object modeling, uh, several products in this category. So we'll select some region of the point cloud and it will automatically fit cylinders to all of the pipes and conduits and railings within this region. Of course, these types of tools can also just be run on the entire point cloud, detecting all of the pipes or all of the walls. Uh, again, several products in this category have these capabilities. Uh, automated object modeling also has its limitations. So um, there's going to be error in the result. There are going to be false positives. So things that aren't pipe may be detected or uh, pipes that exist in reality, but maybe weren't completely scanned will be missed. And a human has to go in and rectify these false positives and false negatives. And then of course, they're also limited in scope. Uh, there are more than just cylindrical objects and planar objects within buildings. Um, and if you want to detect something that isn't a pipe or a wall or structural steel, um, you just don't have any tools on the market for doing that. And so semantic segmentation is kind of the new kid on the block. Uh, it applies the, the newest algorithms in machine learning and deep learning to try to do uh, a kind of a detection that is more comprehensive. Uh, several products in this category, um, you feed in a point cloud and it uh, segments that point cloud into a predefined taxonomy of categories and classes. And there are off the shelf models that can be used and they have their own predefined uh, classes and categories, or you can define your own set of categories and have your own custom model trained. Uh, the benefit of this segmentation is then you can load the point cloud into your modeling software and treat the segments as layers, hiding things that are irrelevant, viewing things that are relevant, just to make the point cloud a little easier to interpret. 
This can be really uh, valuable for novice modelers that aren't as experienced viewing point clouds. This kind of segmentation can also be used for automated asset tagging. Uh, if you're kind of interested and curious about how machine learning and deep learning work, and you haven't received kind of uh, in-depth technical training on the topic, I'll point you towards this video. It's a very short 10 minute explainer. My objective here was to just give you a, an insight into how these algorithms work under the hood. I think you'll find it uh, valuable. Uh, but of course, a semantically segmented point cloud is not the objective. The objective is to get um, this building information model that can successfully interoperate with a massive ecosystem of existing architectural engineering and management tools. And so how do we get these semantically segmented point clouds into the modeling software? Um, the final category of tools, these are the ones that take this semantically interpreted point cloud over the finish line. So there are tools like uh, uh, BricsCAD. They just released uh, some automation related to Scantabim. Once you've semantically segmented your point cloud, you can then automatically fit things like rooms and walls and floors and ceilings to these point clouds. In point views, once you've semantically segmented the walls, the floors, uh, the, the, the ceilings, you can then automatically model uh, walls and windows and doors from these point clouds. And then there are also smaller companies that are working hard to fully automate the Scantabim process, including integrated projects. Uh, if uh, you're interested in accessing the Scantabim automation tool survey, I'm making that available for you here. It also comes with a YouTube playlist of some of these video demos. If uh, maybe you're more technically inclined uh, and you're interested in knowing how these algorithms work, um, I can refer you to uh, my academic journal paper. It's a review article on visual object recognition methods related to uh, digital modeling of existing buildings. Uh, I'll also mention how we uh, can assess these kinds of automation interventions, uh, because of course, not everyone has the kind of impact that we would want on the efficiency of the modeling process. And this also needs to be studied. Um, when modeling in Autodesk Revit, it spits out these log files called journal files during each modeling session. And these log files are just a giant data dump of every state that the software goes through. Um, we wrote a journal parser internally that sifts through the, the, the log and extracts out all of the actions that are taken and their associated timestamps. We can view this action timestamp uh, list in a kind of a time series where we can study the patterns of the modeling process. And if a automation tool is having an impact, we'll see it here. And so we'll run a kind of an IB, uh, uh, sorry, an AB experiment where we run the typical modeling process as the control, we'll run the uh, automation intervention, uh, and then we'll just compare, did it actually decrease the amount of time uh, involved in modeling? Did it uh, improve the patterns of modeling at all? And in this way, we can do assessments that are fairly rigorous. We are also working on uh, our own proprietary internal algorithms for Scantabim. Uh, our advantage is that we have probably the best Scantabim machine learning data set in the world because of its size, diversity, and its strict standardization. And we're leveraging this data to train models for all kinds of things. Um, automated floor area measurement is one example, but we're also pursuing several opportunities within the scan to BIM space. 
Uh, I'll also mention um, uh, another initiative that Integrated Projects is involved with, and that is the Reality Capture Network Forum and Committees organization. So we are uh, an organization that takes quality very seriously and maintaining quality as we scale is always top of mind for us. And we believe that the only way to achieve this is through education and making educational, high quality educational resources widely available. Uh, and so Reality Capture Network is launching a series of committees where uh, people with experience and expertise come together, deliberate on best practices, and then we will synthesize all of this content and make it available to the community. Um, we're also launching a, a discourse forum where uh, people in the industry can come together and just discuss and ask and answer questions related to the technologies and the industries that we all operate in. So if that sounds uh, of interest to you, please join us. And of course, you can always connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, thanks for uh, tuning in.